This is David Diaz, former WBC lightweight champion of the world, and you're listening to The Grueling Truth. Welcome to Mike and Aaron's Sports World on the Grueling Truth Radio Network. I'm your host, Mike Goodpaster, and I want to welcome in my co-host who picked the NCAA Final Four almost completely wrong, as I picked it all completely right, Aaron Zepnik. How are you doing tonight, Aaron? I'm doing well again, Mike. How are you doing? All right, and the University of Kentucky still sucks. All right, um, hopefully someday it'll get a football program to go with the basketball program. That'd be nice. That's all you can say? That'd, that'd be nice. All right, so we're going to start I, I do, off I do with... I like that Randall Cobb's on the Packers, though. What's that guy do? He's always hurt, too. He's he's from Kentucky, and he's actually been a pretty darn good player. Yeah, when he's healthy. But it, y'all still don't win nothing. Been a while. At least you beat the Steelers when you did. But we're going to start off our first topic tonight will be Josh Gordon smoking weed. I think Josh Gordon, if they make a fourth Cheech and Chong movie, I think he'd probably be the middle guy there. What do you think? They'll just add him to that. But do you think Josh Gordon should be suspended indefinitely or just basically terminated from the NFL? I do, Mike. And and the reason I think that is because he's had, you know, how many chances. you got guys that – can't even get a second chance for doing something stupid. This guy's been doing stuff stupid since he came in the league. He's obviously not learning a lesson, and the longer he has the money to spend on stuff like that, I don't think he'll ever change. And, you know, the rumors now with him and Manziel living together, are they not? Or You know, they can't be a good uh, a good mix to, to be hanging with each other. Well, um, my problem is this. Who didn't get a second chance in the NFL? Ray Rice? Ray Rice didn't get a second chance? So you're going to equate beating the hell out of your wife on video with smoking weed? No, but regardless, he didn't get a second chance. It's not what he did that... Yeah, but he's not suspended from the NFL. Just nobody wants him because his production had gone down. It's just like Greg Hardy probably did worse stuff than Ray Rice, but Greg Hardy's production was at its peak when it happened. Yeah, and he's getting a second chance. He got a second chance with Dallas. You know, the question isn't how severe the the crime or the punishment was. The question is who didn't get a second chance. Ray, yeah, Ray, Ray Rice has, has not been suspended. suspended. I mean, Ray, Dar- Ray Rice is not suspended right now from the NFL. It's just that well, nobody thinks they can help. exempt list, the last I heard. Well, um, I, I think he has even, even if Josh, okay, if you're a GM or an owner, if Josh Gordon's reinstated right now, are you picking him up? Yeah, I would in a heartbeat. He's a talent, but if he's not on the field, if he keeps breaking the substance, yeah, but that's not the point. The point is this: is that can he help you? Something you should be suspended for. I mean, you got a guy. You remember Leonard Little? Yes, Leonard Little, in 1998, killed a woman, got four years probation and community service. I mean, in 2003. He was arrested for harassing a police officer. In 2004, he got a DUI for speeding. Now, in 2004, when he got the DUI for speeding, he wasn't even suspended. You got a guy like Dave Deal, who was a New York Giant, very good lineman, who got busted for a DUI. He called Roger Goodell and admitted to it right away. He was not suspended. So once again, I mean, the other thing is this. Alcohol, to me, is a lot bigger infraction than marijuana. Over the last 18 years, there's been three players that have killed people in DUI accidents. Well, and that's absolutely illegal, but the difference is right now in 48 states, marijuana is illegal. And the the precedence the NFL sets, is there is a double standard. I, I will never disagree with that. However, if you have a rule and it's broken, that player has to eventually either change his ways or – move on and it's proven now how many times in a row josh gordon cannot change his ways yeah but see jim ursay can't either they do nothing to him and he's an owner in the league he's had multiple duis and the problem is this alcohol is a lot more dangerous substance than marijuana i agree but it's not treated that way a player can go out and drink all he wants as long as he doesn't get in a wreck he's fine with that so i mean we're going to ruin josh gordon's life because he smoked weed which hurts nobody but himself and, I mean, I just I, – I don't see the correlation here of what's going on with this. I mean, the thing is this. Josh Gordon's a great football player. He's not Johnny Manziel. I mean, 
nobody's Johnny Manziel except for Johnny Manziel. But, I mean, also the fact is this. You've got players that they put on Vicodin. I mean, Vicodin is one of the most dangerous drugs there is, but it's legal. But yeah, still, it doesn't make it right, you know? Right. I mean, you've got players that use marijuana for pain relief. Mm-hmm. I mean, would you rather? I mean, would, would you rather be hooked on Vicodin the rest of your life, or smoke weed to cure what's wrong with you? I mean, Vicodin destroys the inside of your I don't body. Think weed's an addictive drug. That's why I don't get that Josh Gordon can't get off it. And yeah, but uh, but this but, is let's the thing. talk about the Johnny Menzel thing for a minute. Johnny Menzel, who has he hurt besides himself? He is drunk constantly. His organization. <laughs> yes. Now, Josh Gordon. I mean, Josh Gordon, I don't see a bunch of pictures of him all over the place doing stupid crap. He just fails drug tests from time to time, which that's every time he takes it. So I I think the biggest problem is this. In the long run, Josh Gordon's got to not be stupid. But when you look at all the guys that have done worse stuff that don't get punished as badly as he does, and I know it's happened more than once, happened more than twice, but it's still the NFL is so damn hypocritical that it's unbelievable. I mean, they'll shoot players up. They'll give them Vicodin, which gets them hooked on it. You know, I mean, all this stuff happens. They don't take care of retired players. But Josh Gordon smoked weed, so he's in trouble. Jim Irsay is an owner, which means he is the face of the of the Indianapolis Colts franchise. Mm-hmm. He has been arrested for DUI at least five times in the last 15 years. Nothing ever happens. They give him a little bitty fine. You know, nobody tells him he can't run his team for a year. Well, in my opinion, if Jim Irsay is arrested five times for DUIs, number one, what the hell is he doing with a car? Number two, maybe the NFL should start taking a harder stance against owners and GMs and stuff. But a rule's a rule. And and my dad always told me, if you don't want to get in trouble, you don't want the consequences, don't break the rule. It's not like Josh Gordon doesn't know that this is a rule. He is well aware that smoking marijuana is a rule. So, and he still chooses to do it. Is there a huge double standard with the NFL in a lot of different areas? Absolutely. But the bottom line is he's sticking two middle fingers up at Roger Goodell in the NFL saying, you know what, I'm going to be me, I'm going to do me, you know, I'm going to smoke weed, I'm going to do what I want to do. You take the stance you have to take. If he used his talent and used his head a little bit, that guy could be one of the best receivers in the NFL. Well, I cheer for him because he sticks both middle fingers up at Roger Goodell, who's completely ruining the NFL anyways. And, and I understand that, but the double standard doesn't just fall on the NFL. It falls on the fans. It falls on the, the organizations. It's everybody. Because you look at look at the media with, with Gronk. Gronk goes out on a on a two-day pisser. He can put all the pictures he wants. All of a sudden, Manziel does it. Well, he's a quarterback. He's got to, you know, hold himself to a higher standard. Yeah, it's because he's Manziel, and Manziel wants to draw attention to himself. So does Gronk. But the difference between the two is this. Gronk has done something. You know, Gronk is one of the best tight ends to ever play football. Johnny Manziel is a guy that when he goes in the game, you know, is 5 for 20 for 57 yards and three interceptions. You but don't get a Joe pass Namath when has you done suck. something. Joe Namath is now – I, I, a lot of people were commenting that he was drunk when he interviewed reporters, asked if he could kiss him and all that on the sideline. Yeah, he was, but that was actually after he was a quarterback, so they made a bigger deal out of it because there's a quarterback. Well, no, 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 wait a second now. Joe Namath was allowed to get away with murder because of the time he played in. Joe Namath, when he asked Susie Colbert to kiss her, that was like 2002, 2003. So he wasn't playing. But, but the other problem is this. I mean, maybe it's a racial thing. You know, Gronk can get away with it. Josh Gordon can't get away with it. But Manziel I mean, can't either, and he's, he's Bob obviously... Ursay is an old, or Robert Ursay is an old, rich white guy. I, I don't think I, I wouldn't want. I don't want to, you know, look at it that way and think that race has anything to do with it. I mean, you you have a lot of players. Look at Lawrence Taylor. Lawrence Taylor was a cocaine user. Who had yeah, but he got suspended multiple times, too. Yes. So it wasn't like he just got away with it scot-free. No, but he never got yeah. banned for life. I don't think he should be banned for life. I think the same thing I said last week with uh, Greg Hardy and, and with Ray Rice. 
all these guys that do stuff like this, I think they should go through a, a thorough counseling, a thorough drug and rehab, and if they can continue and, and finish the classes and do what responsible people have to do in order to show that they're going to abide by some sort of, you know, rules, whether they're double standards or not, you know, then I welcome them all back. I am all for a man being able to change himself and better himself and become a, you know, a better human being on and off the field. I'm not a, I'm not an eye for an eye guy. I'm not a guy that thinks, oh, no, he did my franchise wrong once or twice. Screw him. I think that everyone deserves a second chance. And as long as he's taken the necessary steps in the protocol that's the same for everybody, then welcome him back. But until he does that, I say he should sit on the sideline. All right, here, here's my question. Now. You just said before that marijuana was not addictive. What kind of drug treatment are we giving him then? What do, what do people that are addicted to cocaine or meth? or? Uh, there's a huge difference between cocaine and meth and marijuana. I understand that, but if it's a rule, they should still have to go through some sort of drug rehabilitation program. So what are you rehabbing them from if it's not addictive, though? It's a way of thinking. It's it's not that it's – if he's not addicted to it, why doesn't he just stop doing it? Because he doesn't want to. <laughs> well, then he doesn't want to play very much. <laughs> well, he's an idiot. It's like my son, he's a complete idiot. Time, but, the, but the thing is this. And he continues to bad grades. He knows he doesn't play. Like hey, my in, in, the, in the NFL, though, uh, my problem is there's so much crap that goes on that shouldn't go on that people get away with. But, you know, they want to pick on Johnny Manziel for going out and having fun. I mean, he's 23 years old. He's a starting quarterback in the NFL, and he's got a lot of money. How many guys, when they're 23 in that situation, aren't going to go out and chase some skirts and drink some beer? Now, if he gets a DUI, that's different. You shouldn't be driving under any circumstances if you're drinking. You know, but when you look at this, I mean, it's just there's so many double standards here. And I don't think that I, – I know, I know they got the new drug and alcohol policy. I mean, I just don't see where they are fairly penalizing guys. I mean, the weed thing – I mean, how about this? Let them smoke it from February to June, and then after that, they got to be off of it, and you test them weekly. And if it's for, if it's for an injury where they're rehabbing, you know – Doctors note, hey, this may show up in his system. If it's just that, you know, maybe they need to make an exception for that, Mike. I'm not saying that. If that they made an exception for that, that would be fine, but then everybody's going to be hurt and doing it for that also. So, I mean, either way you go, you're screwed. You and the NFL doesn't really it. care because this is the thing. With the three players that have killed people in the last 16, 17 years, the Leonard Littles, the Dante Stallworths, I mean, right there, if the NFL had a conscience – they would immediately stop using the beer advertising. This is true. If it was that big a deal to them. Yeah, and I can't give you an answer on that. I don't understand why they continue to promote beer and stuff when they're players. That, that's something I never even looked at, to be quite well, honest. Well, the other thing is this. Because I like to have a beer when I go to the Packer game. I live within walking distance. I know I'm not hurting anybody. So I don't think there's anything wrong with having a few beers. Yeah, but, but the thing is this, when you have that problem and you're trying to be high and mighty on everything, well, let's be high and mighty all the way. The thing exactly. is this, they're high and mighty and they have standards as long as it doesn't cut into their profit. Even when I want to disagree with you, I can't disagree with you. <laughs> but, let's, I mean, I'm always right. But, let's, <laughs> but, but I mean, really. I don't like the, the NFL, double standards of, of the NFL you don't hear about this stuff in, like, the NHL where, you know, guys are getting habitually suspended or guys are keep doing, prob- you know, things that are, you know, a problem and a detriment to the league. You do hear some stuff about guys, you know, hitting guys in the head with a stick and, you know, stuff like that once in a while, but it's few and far between. And when it happens, it's usually the only time it happens because they take the same stance, the firm stance, with something severe every time. Yeah, and, and like I said, the NFL is the, I mean, it's, the NFL is so messed up that when the schedule comes out, when the schedule comes out, if you look at it and you want to talk about the bigger thing and the problems there, if they scheduled the Bengals to play the Steelers in December, 
in Cincinnati at 8.30 at night. Now, when you have the biggest rivalry in the NFL, just the same way they did with the playoffs last year. So you're going to have Bengals and Steelers fans who already hate each other. The teams hate each other. You're going to have everybody there from 10 o'clock in the morning on drinking. And then you're going to get upset because there's fights in the stands and the players act the way they do in an atmosphere like that. Yeah. And that happens out west. I know there's been a lot of stuff out west that's happened, and I don't want to assume, you know, alcohol played a factor in it, but you'd almost have to think so. I know there was a stabbing or two at San Francisco in the last five years. Um, You know, San Diego, I know, had some problems out there. And, I mean, is is that what's to blame for all this? I mean, alcohol, if people can't drink alcohol and have a good time, then maybe they should stay home. Or well, not drink thing. I don't understand why you'd want to go to a game and drink alcohol when it's going to cost you ten dollars for a beer. Not if you know the right people, Mike. <laughs> what are you doing to get your beer in Green Bay, there, Aaron? <laughs> I'm not at liberty to discuss this on air. <laughs> <laughs> but all right, cool. let's go ahead and I'll switch. Look. We'll switch to another topic. We'll get off that topic because I don't want to go any farther with it from your response there. But the NBA playoffs start tomorrow. Um, we'll go ahead and break down each series. We're going to start off with the Cleveland Cavaliers and the Detroit Pistons, Aaron. Too much LeBron. Uh, as much as I don't want to see him even win a series, uh, I'm not a big LeBron fan. But I just don't think Detroit has the firepower to play with Cleveland. I, I see Cleveland either sweeping or, or winning it in five. I think Drummond has a big game rebounding-wise, one of the home games in Detroit. I think Detroit will get one game from him. I think Cleveland wins it in five also. Um, next series, number two seed, the Toronto Raptors against the Indiana Pacers, the number seven seed. Uh, Toronto. Uh, I think Toronto's got too much as well. and Indiana doesn't have the uh, the depth. Uh I just, I just think there's too much too much there for home field, you know, home court advantage there. And uh, I don't know a lot about either team, but Toronto's the two seed for a reason, and uh, Indiana's the seven and a week west. So, or, I'm sorry, a week east. So I just don't see much of an upset coming from uh, from Indiana. Yeah, I think the Pacers are capable of winning a game or two in a series. Paul George has really dropped off since midseason, which you know, is to be expected after missing an entire year last year. Um, I think he can shut down the Raptors' best player, DeMar DeRozan. Um, but I just think the Raptors are too deep. I, I'm going to take the Raptors in six. It hurts me to say it since I'm a Pacers fan. But I'm hoping when I say that you're a Milwaukee Buck fan, which makes you even more pathetic than me. I'm actually not, and I'm not even telling you what team I like. Oh, so it must even be worse than mine. All right. So <laughs> They're not in the playoffs, let me just tell you that. Okay. Um, next series. Miami, the number three seed against Charlotte, the number six. Is Dwayne Wade still playing in the NBA? Isn't he like 64 yeah, years old? he's still a hell of a player. Uh, I'd take Miami in six. I think that, uh, you know, Dwayne Wade has the experience, and uh, I don't see Charlotte upsetting them either. All right, I disagree. I think Charlotte be- beats them in six. I think Kemba Walker will have a huge series. I think Charlotte's better defensively. I think Charlotte upsets them. That brings us to the next series, which is Atlanta and Dow- or Boston. I picked Atlanta, but I could see Boston putting up a fight in this series. Um, but I went, I went to Atlanta. I'll say. Right. I'm going to dis- I'm going to disagree again. I'm going to go with Boston. I think it'll be a defensive series. I think it'll be boring as hell. But I think Boston wins it in six or seven. Um, that'll take us to the Western Conference, where they actually play basketball. <laughs> we will go to number one seed, Golden State, against the number eight seed, Houston. Well, I think Golden State sweeps Houston, honestly. Uh, I know a lot of people disagree with that, and saying Houston might actually give them a run, but they went 73-9 and nine for a reason. Steph Curry, Jamon Green, you know, they, they just have – they have too many guys that are hungry yet and young and their legs are not going to be, you know, dead. They're going to, they're going to still have some gas in the tank. And I think golden state actually sweeps Houston. 
Yeah, I agree with you. I think Golden State sweeps them also. Maybe Harden goes off and scores 70 in a game and they get one win, but that's about the only way it would happen. Um, that brings us to San Antonio, the number two seed against the Memphis Grizzlies, number seven. I want to pick Memphis in this series because I think they're an up-and-coming team, but I just don't think that they have enough to deal with. Popovich is a hell of a coach, and uh, Grandpa Duncan and you know all the guys at, at uh, San Antonio yet, um, I just think that they have too much, and I think they get past Memphis here in five. Yeah, I think San Antonio sweeps them, actually. Um, Oklahoma City against Dallas. Oklahoma City is the number three. Dallas is the number six. I got OKC, and uh, you know, I think that uh, I think that Oklahoma City has been a pretty steady team all year. And again, they're they're a three seed for a reason. Uh, I don't think Dallas has much of anything to uh, compete with them, even even in the West, where you know, getting a six seed isn't as bad as getting a six in the East. I still don't think that they can uh, overtake Oklahoma City. Yeah, I like OKC in five. I figure Dirk Nowitzki at home will have one big game where he looks young again, but I think Oklahoma City wins it. Um, We have probably what on paper is the best matchup, number four seed Clippers against the number five seed Trailblazers. What's your thoughts there? I uh, Actually, this is the one upset I picked was Portland over the Clippers. Um, the the distraction with Blake Griffin this year with uh, punching a equipment guy and I just think Portland uh, Portland Wesley Matthews is a good player went to Marquette by the way and um, I, I think Portland will win that one in seven I think that one goes all the way all right I'm gonna go with the Clippers I think the Clippers in five I don't think they'll have as much trouble as people think but so we'll do this as we go along each round here. I guess we'll pick each one, but let's go ahead and go Golden State against the Clippers then. I'd pick Gold, Golden State either way, um, whether it's Portland or or the Clippers. Again, I, I think they're destined to make a run. I I actually think uh, they might sweep that series as well. All right. What about San Antonio against Oklahoma City, which is a great series. I think that one will be seven games. I think it'll be, uh, and the longer that series goes on, I think Oklahoma City has the advantage because of the fact of the youth. San Antonio's got some young players that are that are pretty good. Uh, Kawhi Leonard's not bad, and um, but I, I picked Oklahoma City in the upset. All right, so that would give you in the Western Conference Final, Oklahoma State and Golden or Oklahoma City and Golden State. What's your pick there? I pick Golden State in six to uh, beat Oklahoma City. Uh, I just think Golden State is, is the best team in basketball, and for good reason. I mean, the 73-9 and nine speaks for itself, uh, and Steph Curry is the MVP. I mean, he, he can get a quick shot off against anybody, and they play good defense, and they t- play team basketball, and in the playoffs, I think that's what matters. All right, I'm going to go with Golden State against San Antonio in the Western Conference Finals. I'm going to take Golden State in five. Wouldn't surprise me if it's a little bit different than that. I think San Antonio is a great team. I just think the age is going to hurt them. San Antonio has the advantage with the coach. Oh, Popovich is as good as anybody that's ever coached in the NBA, I think, and he's proven that for a long period of time. Um, Eastern Conference. Let's see. What do we got here? We got one and five. So you got Atlanta against Cleveland. I do, and I got Cleveland and uh, too much LeBron there. And... Uh, I, I think that'll be a longer series. I think it'll go six or seven games, but I think Cleveland will win it. All right, and then you've got Toronto against Miami. And I picked Miami just because of Dwayne Wade. I think at this stage of his career, he's got something left to prove, and I think uh, being another Marquette guy, i got to go with him. All right, and you got Cleveland and Miami in the championship round. And another, you know, Dwayne Wade-LeBron matchup, uh, I think LeBron gets them, and they go on to play Golden State. Uh, Long series. Again, I think it'll be seven. Uh, I think Cleveland will get them at home the seventh game. All right. I'm going to go with Cleveland against Toronto with Cleveland to win it. So we both got Cleveland, Golden State in the final. Do we have an upset prediction from you? No. I think it's just too much Golden State. They're too deep. Um, They play good defense. Like I said, they they, – 
I just if they if they put it this way, Mike, if they lost nine games in '82, I can't see them losing four out of seven to anyone. Yeah. So I mean, it's almost a no-brainer. I think that's probably everybody's bracket. Um, I don't I don't see. And plus, my 12-year-old said that if I uh, picked anyone to beat Golden State, he'd he'd be upset and not take the trash out for a week. So. So you get you can get your 12-year-old to take the trash out. Believe it or not, yes. Okay, we'll see what happens when he's 13. Things change then. <laughs> <laughs> At least it did with mine. Now about all you think they can do is get up on their own, and sometimes I have to pick them up and push them out the door anyways to get them to go to school. But, yeah, I'm going to go Cleveland Golden State. I'm going to take Golden State in five or six games. I don't think anybody's going to be able to beat them. Now the question is this. Is this Golden State team the greatest team in NBA history? Well, the regular season record says so, but you touch base on the uh, Celtics and Lakers teams in the '80s, and you got to at least put Chicago's team in that in that conversation. It would be great to see them all play each other in their prime, but obviously Father Time won't allow that. Um, they got to be up there. I mean, they set the record, you know, all time wins record. And, I said last week they got to go for the record, and they did, and they got it. So congratulations to Steve Kerr and Golden State. So the answer to that to you is no. I don't. I don't know that I'd be ready to say they were the best ever because there's a lot of teams that I never really watched. Um, I, I don't think that they could have played in the in the '80s and '90s with those teams like the the Lakers with Worthy and and AC Green and Magic and Kareem and go on and on, and then the, the bad boys of Detroit. Um, not that Detroit was one of the best teams ever, but they played oh, they in were. the era where... There's no doubt could, they were. What do you mean they weren't? They went to the finals three straight years, won it all twice. Well, I mean, and, and I'm saying they were good, and they were one of the top five, but I'm not ready to say that they were you know above this Golden State team. What I'm saying is I don't know that this Golden State team could play with those bangers of the 80s. I don't think they could. And also, the thing you got to remember is this. With that Detroit team, defensively at the guard position with Isaiah Thomas and Joe Dumars, they were as good as anybody, ever. And then you throw in the Lambeers and the Mahorns, the Dantleys, all those guys underneath. I think they slay. It's a lot easier to slow a game down than it is to speed a game up. And, I mean, to me, still the two best teams I ever saw by far were the 86 Celtics and the 87 Lakers. I know I ran a poll on our Twitter page, and like 70% of people said the 96 Bulls. And if you're out there and you're one of those 70% of people, you're crazy. And if you want, you send us an email at thegruelingtruth at gmail.com, and you can come on the show and debate it with us. But, I mean, the 96 Bulls had two great players and then a bunch of role players. You look at the 86 Celtics, the 87 Lakers, they all had four or five great players. And, I mean, they were pulling guys like Scott Webman, Bill Walton, you know, A.C. Green off the bench. These guys were all all all-stars at one point or another. I mean, hell, if you look at the 86 Celtics, their, like, 11th man was Scott Webman. Their 10th man was Jerry Sheesting. They'd both been in NBA all-star games before they got to the Celtics. Yeah, and we talked about that a little bit last week off air, Mike, and I, and I couldn't agree more. I mean, I remember the the Robert Parrish, Kevin McHale, Bill Walton, Dennis Johnson. You know, for me being 39, I was 10 years old when that team was playing. And for, and obviously the guy we didn't even name there is Larry Bird. Um, but for me to be a 10-year-old and to remember that many players, they were they were pretty darn good. Because I can't name a football team, I can't tell you ten guys off their team that wasn't the Packers from the '86, '87 seasons. Yeah, uh, yeah that, I think the big difference between those teams, the '86 Celtics, the '87 Lakers, were just the benches. I mean, hell, Michael Thompson, who was the backup center to Kareem, would have started for 98 percent of the teams in the NBA right now. And also, the NBA was different back then; it was rougher, probably according to what rules you play with, too. And, you know, you didn't get to see any zone defenses if you're shooting threes. It was all straight man because you weren't allowed to play a zone. Right, and there's a, a lot of illegal defense stuff back then. And to be honest with you, Mike, I haven't watched near as much NBA. In fact, I don't really watch the NBA much at all because I don't like two-man game where six of the ten guys on the court are kind of standing around. 
Well, that's and, the good thing about Golden State, though. They don't play that way. Golden State plays more like a team from the 70s or 80s. Right, yeah, with different a, rules, though. I don't think they yeah, could hang with, with the Parrish and McHale and, and Walton down low. I don't think they could hang with Kareem and Worthy and, and um, yeah. you know, Magic Johnson. Or, or the 67 Philadelphia 76ers. They were really good, too. Will Chamberlain. Is that the all team with... Doctor, oh no, the eight, no, Doctor the 80, J would have been 80, the '83 Sixers, which I also think they had trouble with. That was a great team, but I mean, the, the other thing is this: the difference between those '80s teams and like the '96 Bulls or the Warriors of today. The '96 Bulls never had to beat a great team to win a championship. I mean, by the time they beat Detroit, I mean, let's face it: by the time they beat Detroit, Detroit was old. I mean, Detroit cleaned their clock for three or four years before they got a little long in the tooth and lost to them. Well, and, and you look at the teams they did beat. Look at the Utah Jazz. They had Carl Malone and John Stockton and Jeff Hornacek. Who and that else was did, it. Yeah, who else did they have that you could even name? So, I mean, you had Danny Ainge on that Celtics team. You had, you know, Byron Scott, Michael Cooper, all these guys that I still remember to this day, and I can tell you their jersey numbers even. And... uh you know, I can't tell you ten guys off one team in the NBA right now. No, I'd probably be hard pressed to tell you ten guys in the NBA. Now I'm just kidding because we did an NBA preview show, and of course I watch it all the time. But yeah, I mean, I, I still watch it, but I don't watch it like I used to. I mean, pretty yeah, much. And I, and I try to catch some games, but the Bucks aren't very good right now, and my Lakers aren't very good right now. You're so, Lakers. Uh, you're a Laker fan, so let's talk about Kobe. Kobe scores sixty points his final game. It took fifty-two shots. Does that diminish what he did in that game absolutely that's the one thing about Kobe is I think I think my dad was a pretty good shooter and if my dad took 52 shots around around the three-point arc or around the free throw lane even he, he could score 60 points in a game if, if he was just shooting up shots all night long so and he's dead so um well he's a hell of a I, shooter don't I, I, <laughs> I'm glad Kobe got 60 points. I'm glad he had a cool farewell, kind of like the Jeter and the Cal Ripken farewell. It's a feel-good story, but really, you know, for him to be able to do that, that just says, you know, the the rest of the guys on that team, I mean, he scored 60. What did they end up with? I think they had like 101. Yeah, so 41 points out of all other guys that stepped on the court. I mean, that's why individuals will never beat a team. Well, um, that's... We used Michael Jordan used to do though. I remember he scored sixty three against the Cavs one time. I mean, it's yeah, but he had Scotty Pippen or you know, and like you said, they had role players, you know, and the role players would hit timely threes like Paxson or you know, get yeah, a but it's Kobe's a defense, like as bad as that Lakers team is, they're not scoring unless Kobe's shooting fifty times, anyways. <laughs> this is true. I mean, but, so what the hell? He took the game over. He won the game. I'll give him credit for it. What the hell? I like Kobe. I mean, to me, the I give game him credit. I like Kobe, but I just think it's, that when you're shooting 52 times in a game, I mean, that, that's a lot of shots. I think my yeah, but it was the last game, and you know what? You know, they let Michael Strahan get the sack record that one year too. So that stuff happens. But <laughs> this is true. Yeah, but I, I like Kobe. The game that stands out to me to Kobe, why he's a great player. I'm a huge Pacer fan. Would have been game four of the 2000 NBA Finals, where if the Pacers win that game, it's two games all, and they got to play game five back in Indiana. The series, you know, is in the balance, and he comes out, and in the fourth quarter in the two overtimes, just completely takes over the game. And, I mean, yeah, he, he had the capability he, he, of doing that. I don't think he is the greatest player that ever lived. But I'd put him in the top ten. He's definitely a top ten player. You know, if he play again, if he played in the eighties, would he have been a top ten player then? Yeah, I think he I would. don't know that. Why not? Because a different style. Um, I don't think that uh, I don't think Kobe would have had the success in the eighties because of the fact that people actually played a little bit of defense back then, and. You had guys like the, the Bucks. I mean, you had we talked about this last week. You had guys like Sidney Moncrief and and Terry Cummings and Paul Pressey. I mean, there was some pride there, and uh, even even they made the playoffs quite a few years and back in the eighties. And 
I, I just don't see. I think he would have been more of a more of a guy like that, like a like a role type guy. I don't think he'd have been a role type guy. He may not have been as successful as he was the last fifteen years in the NBA, but I don't think he would have ever been a role type guy. I still think he'd been a hell of a player, and it's just according to what team he'd have been on too. You know, if he'd have been an Indiana Pacer in the nineteen eighties, then he'd have probably been screwed. But you throw him on the Lakers with Magic, he'd probably be pretty good. But that's the thing. I don't put him up there with guys like Magic Johnson, Larry Bird. You know, what's he done without a big man though? Everything he's won has been when Shaq was there, or you know, he hasn't won much on his own. Well, you know what? Jordan didn't win anything on his own. Nobody wins anything on their own. Jordan didn't win until they had Pippen. Bird had McHale, all those guys. Magic had Worthy, Kareem, all those guys. Tell me somebody who won when they didn't have another guy. This is true. That's why teams beat individuals. Yeah. So, but every once in a while, an individual can get one win. You just can't win a best of seven series, I guess. Right. <laughs> but I mean, when the perfect example playoffs, is you, in, you have to have more than one player that can score, and you well, have to have per, five guys that buy in. Perfect example. Nineteen eighty-six, game two, first round of the playoffs. The great Celtic team against the Bulls. Jordan scores sixty-three points. They still lose in double overtime. Didn't Bird have sixty-one that game too? No, I think Bird was right around 40, but hell, McHale throws in 20, Perry throws in 20, Haynes throws in 10, Dennis Johnson scores 15. I mean, that was the difference. It, and in basketball, it can be very, very misleading, in my opinion. You can score 60 and play like crap, and you can score 30 and play excellent. Is it done at both, both ends of the floor? Is it like Emily free throws? You know, there's a lot of different things that aren't, you know, looked at. It's just the final stat line, you know, and, and I think that's that's what players nowadays are, are all about is the three and the stat line. Yeah. Well, threes are a lot more prevalent now. I mean, it used to be a 24-foot shot that Niners only usually like one guy on a team that could shoot 33% from there. And usually yeah, the, three was only used as, the three was usually only used as a shot when you fell behind also. Yeah, exactly. Now now kids don't even want to shoot the free throw, you know, the elbow jumpers. I coached high school basketball last year, and uh, kids would look down at their feet and step back before they'd shoot the ball, and then it's getting blocked because they're taking that extra second and a half to get the three, you know. Yeah, but it's kind of stupid to shoot it from 18 feet and get two, and you can just step back a step and get three. Not if it's in rhythm and it's a good shot. Eh. <laughs> three still worth more than two either way. If you want to have that argument, we can do that next week. <laughs> then we'll know you're a U.K. basketball fan if you argue that two's worth more than three. But <laughs> Two's not so, worth more than three, but look at the percentages. That's according who's shooting it, I'm too. Say. You know, Steph Curry's, what, 45%? J.J. Redick, I think he's 46%. So. But you're talking about one or two guys. Look at the league average. I said it's according to who's shooting it. You don't have to jump my ass. I wasn't disagreeing. I said it's according to who's shooting it. Damn, back off a little bit. You didn't take your medicine today, did you? I'm just, I'm trying to disagree with you, Mike. <laughs> well, you hurt my feelings when you disagree with me. You know I hate confrontation. <laughs> you were just telling me how you can argue with either side, and now I argue with you, and then you don't want me to argue with you. You're right, Mike. Oh, uh, well, I want to wrap this up. I want to go to bed. I got football practice in the morning. But <laughs> you got any final words, Aaron? No, good luck to uh, all the teams that are uh, starting to play off, and uh, hopefully your uh, team can get back on the winning track yourself tomorrow. No, and, we uh, just got practice tomorrow. We don't have a game for three weeks. We play at Western Michigan. But we played a game in Chicago this last weekend where I'm pretty sure we got screwed on purpose. But... I'll digress about that, unless you want to talk about it a lot, but I don't want to get We can talk anything. about it. I don't have anything to do with it. If you're tired, I mean, you're old. I know you're probably well, going to well, get to I'll bed. Well, I'll tell you this. We, we go to play this game, all right? We're a travel team, which means we have no home games till next year, all right? We're supposed okay. to play a team in Chicago called the Blitz, all right? They've been around for a few years. They're supposed to kick our ass because they pay their players a lot, and we're a travel team. Well, we get there, and right away, you know, we got – my assistant coach getting in a yellow match with their GM because somebody, is, I guess, a guy by the name of Jim Terry, who's an idiot, had told them that I said stuff about them, and he'd been telling me they said stuff. So everybody's arguing there. But we go out, we played a game. And the officials, I mean, in the first five minutes, 
I'm bitching about their calls. And the one official walks over to me and said, this is the first time we've ever done a game at this level. We're semi-pro officials. Yeah. He said, he said, you might have to help me with the rules here. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. You know, it's supposed to be a professional football game, and I got a guy asking me to – and they had no clue what the rules were. In the first quarter, we had a guy by the name of Jet Williams, great receiver out of Eastern Kentucky, think he played a higher level. He makes a diving catch for a touchdown in the end zone. He hits the carpet and slides into the wall head first. The problem is there was one section of padding missing in the corner of that end zone, and he went head first into it. Ouch. Okay. So I get pissed off. I go running out on the field. I'm cussing the official out, and I'm telling him about the pad, how it's not where it's supposed to be. And he said, well, it was there. They just moved it after he hit. Now, I'm from Indiana, but I'm not a complete moron. So I tell him there's no way. So luckily, the game's on film, and you can see that the first quarter, that is completely that, that section is missing because one of the chain crew had moved it. Okay. This is on Chicago because they, instead of using the regular AIF officials, that's the league, they decided not to spend as much money, so they used semi-pro officials from the Chicago area. Okay. So all this is on Chicago, all right? Now, the bad thing about it, these officials, when I was on the field with the defense, the time before I came off the field, I kept telling that official that that pad was not there. It needed to be moved back there. And he just waved me off. All right, that was two plays before it happened. The last play, I start screaming, hey, you stupid, me, bleep that out. I said, you got to put that pad there. And he looked at me and laughed. And then 10 seconds later, we're hitting the wall. And actually, you can watch the game on YouTube. It happens towards the end of the first quarter. And you can actually hear his helmet crack off the glass when he hits. Is now, he the okay? thing is, Yeah, he's all right. The, the thing that's amazing about this whole thing is this. We go on through the game. They call penalties against us that are completely made up. We end up losing the game on the last play of the game. But after the game, one of their owners or the GM comes up to me, and he starts bitching because he said that my offensive coordinator had cussed his dad out who was sitting on the side in the stands. Now, I don't know if he did or not. He shouldn't have if he did. But my whole thing is this. They, uh, they treated us like assholes because they thought my assistant coach yelled at somebody. But yet the field was not safe for us to play on, and they let us play on it. And if Jet, you know, is another foot closer to that wall when he hits it, when he hits off the ground, he might have broke his neck. He might be dead right now. But all they want to bring up is the fact that one of my coaches might have said something to one of the owner's parents who was sitting in the stands. You know, and, and the player safety here, I mean, in Chicago, we, they play at the Odium, not the nicest arena in the world. But, I mean, it, you have to make sure that all the padding is where it goes. I mean, we had their one chain guy who looked like there was something wrong with him in his head, if you know what I mean. I want to be politically correct nowadays because, you know, how people are. But he's talking crap to our offensive coordinator the whole game. He's talking crap to our players. Nobody does anything about it. But that's just the world of indoor football. Do you have these officials' names? I mean, you don't have to say them now, but I do want to talk no, I, to you. If I did, I would say them now, but my memory is crap. And that's the other thing. When we have regular game officials, they will ha- ha- come up and hand me the ref card that tells me the name of each guy and where they're positioned on the field. These guys didn't even have that. It was basically Chicago didn't want to pay the money for the regular officiating crew. This is what I'm told. All right? So I'm not stating this as a fact. I'm just telling you what I'm told. But I know these guys are not regular AIF officials. They couldn't afford the $150 for each official. So they went out and got semi-pro. And see, my problem with that is I'm pretty sure the semi-pro officials were semi-pro officials for the owner of the Blitz, who's also the head coach. I mean, I, my guess is probably came from the semi-pro league that his semi-pro team plays in. Nice. So I think we were pretty so much screwed. Really for and when you put player safety in, in jeopardy, and as it's the hind thought, that, that's yeah. that's not ever. A and good. I can tell you this: they came out saying that this Jim Terry guy said I said stuff about him, and I told them if I'm going to say something about you, I will say it. I'm saying it right now. If you guys are listening to this, Vince and Mike, all right? I came up there. I never did nothing wrong. You all acted like idiots. You affected the safety of my players. 
and I can guarantee you this. You won that game, but if you're lucky enough to be in the same league as us next year or any year after, your team will never beat my team again. Well, I'm but that's we my rant for today. I'm glad we talked about this. I think our ratings just went up 20%. In Chicago. Player <laughs> safety has to be the number one focus. I mean, it is in the NFL. It is in the NEFL where I'm coaching, uh, which we make our, I make my semi-pro head coaching debut next Saturday. Uh, I know you're going to be down in Indiana. but um, Yeah, I'll probably I'll walk up to Green Bay for that. I love semi-pro football. I, uh, I would definitely let you know how we do. Um, and uh, we play the Wisconsin Ravens at Kakana High School. All the people that are listening, come on out and support us. Um, Fox Valley Force. Well, I feel Kekana bad for you because you're going to have semi-pro officials then. <laughs> well, if there's good semi-pro is this, officials. If you're, you're a semi-pro, semi-pro official wall, out though. there, if you're a semi-pro <laughs> they, they official out there, I'm not taking it. Right? Hey, if I'm if you're a semi-pro official out there, I'm not taking a shot at you because you're a semi-pro official. I'm taking a shot at the blitz because if you're a semi-pro outdoor official, you're not going to have a damn clue what the rules are in an indoor football game. Exactly. And as you you get a test to yourself, Aaron, you coached indoor football a little bit with the blizzard. It is a lot faster game than outdoors. Not only that, I actually have I've been a semi-pro official for about twelve years. I've worked a lot of games in in a lot of different leagues, and it is not even a comparison on how fast the game moves in the, in the indoor in that box. That wall will give you a headache, and you know for for guys to not take player safety into consideration. And if I don't know what I'm doing, and I walked into an arena right now and I tried to do a blizzard game, I'm walking the field with my official compadres. And I'm making sure that the field is at least safe. I don't care what coaches are saying what. I am going to make sure the players are safe. Yeah, I don't know about you, but if I'm an official, which I was for one year at the high school level, like 20-some years ago, if the coach is yelling at me, if something's out of place and something can be hurt, I'm not going to wave them off. I'm going to stop the game and see what's going on. Exactly. I am baffled by that, honestly. Oh, me too. Like I I said, you go on YouTube – you look up Chicago Blitz, Northern Kentucky Nightmare from last weekend. It was a hell of a game that got ruined by really bad officiating. Well, I mean, there, there I'm was. Go I mean, it's right now, Mike. I'm going to watch it. I promise you, and I will give you feedback. Yeah, it's about and, probably three or four minutes left in the first quarter when it happens, and you can see that it's not there. And when you hear our player Jet Williams' head hit that corner, it'll make you sick to your stomach. I'm sure and it the will. fact is, it could have been prevented. Um, all right. I'm going to look this up and watch it. All righty. Well, hey, everybody, I want to remind you to check out the gruelingtruth.net. Um, our, new, our website has been updated. looks fantastic. John Jackson, architect in Indianapolis, a friend of mine, did that for us. I want to thank him. Um, Today we had Rich Tombstone Jackson, one of the greatest defensive ends in NFL history for the Denver Broncos, late 60s, early 70s, was on our show. Yesterday we had Roman Gabriel, who was the 1969 NFL MVP, 1973 Comeback Player of the Year. He was on yesterday, so you can find all those shows on Spreaker, Stitcher, um, iTunes. We will soon to be on TuneIn and iHeart. So make sure you check out all of our shows. You go to grillingcruise.net, get that, get all the articles that has been, have been written by myself, Manny, Matt Andrew Scavage, Rodney Newpel. Then we got a new guy named Taylor. His last name starts with Z, and I can't pronounce it, so I'm sorry about that, Taylor. But you can go read it, and then it'll have his name written there, and you can work out your own interpretation of his last name. So, <laughs> but, thumbs up. Yeah, what if we were going to call him Z, but then we got you, too. So, I mean, you screwed it up for us again. That's but my I name. See, see yeah. I can say Aaron Zepnik, though, but Aaron Zabalabalabalos, I can't. So, <laughs> you know, yep. that's the way it goes. But, well, I want everybody to make sure you check out Sports World next Friday night when we'll be back on. We may have a special guest then working on that right now. But. For right now, for Aaron Zetnick, I'm Mike Goodpastor. You've been listening to The Grueling Truth, where the legends speak.